is in human rights conflict and transformation. And I want to present to you some of my key findings of my research I've been doing the last 10, 15 years. For example, it ended up in my book about understanding terrorism. The main aim of my research has always been understanding terrorism. And the key argument, the key thesis of mine is understanding terrorism is the necessary condition to fight and defeat terrorism. So, we try to develop this argument on the basis of, of sociology of understanding based on the great German thinker Max Weber. And if we integrate the sociology of understanding with applied ethics, moral philosophy, and this brought me analyzing the moral legitimacy of political violence. Now, Max Weber argued that we should analyze the subjective meaning, the meaning people subscribe to their own social active actions. This is subjective reality, not the reality as such, not the reality, the meaning attached to it by the actors. This means applied to my topic question, how do terrorist organizations justify their violent strategies? Also means understanding the terrorism experts too. And you can see, I've used the word terrorist in practice, because terrorism itself is a dead metaphor. It's not a very useful term in analytical terms, because it carries so much normative baggage, such a negative, biased term. No so-called terrorist would allow to be called terrorist. By some contrast, everybody who is an anarchist, communist, would have no problem in being called an anarchist or communist. But you hardly find anybody who is normally called a terrorist or terrorist organization would agree that he is actually a terrorist organization. And let me say this quite clear the term terrorist cannot be defined in a neutral, objective way. It's impossible. In the same way, you cannot use the term pedophile or nigger or whatever in a neutral or non normative way. So I've decided to use the term political violence instead. Keep in mind, terrorist experts, even the United Nations does not have an agreed definition of terrorism. There is no United Nations definition of terrorism. So in that line, as this part, I've been heavily influenced uh, until this day by the Leipzig philosopher Georg Mägle, analytical philosophy. And what Georg did was, on the question of moral legitimacy, he distinguished between weak political violence, which is violence directed against the military, against military targets, against oppression, against dictatorships, which is morally legitimate, and strong political violence, which is violence is against the military too, but it can also happen against civilians, against soft targets, against civilian targets. And at the end of that scale, extremely strong violence, which is not directed against the military, but deliberately against civilians, the deliberate killing of innocents, of women and children. So the journey goes from weak political violence to extremely strong. Now, the questions regarding questions of moral legitimacy, many people would say that, for example, the political violence by Nelson Mandela and the ANC, that was weak political violence or weak terrorism. But it was not nice, but it was necessary to defeat the oppression, the dictatorship of apartheid. So that's why it was morally legitimate. In a similar way, many people would say the question, can extremely strong violence be morally justified? We would say no. Under no circumstances can the deliberate killing of innocents be morally justified. However, when we open up the history books, there are many cases where it actually happened. It's some pictures from the bombing of Dresden, a German city. In the middle of the night, 13th of February 1945, US and UK bombers bombed not the German military, not military targets, but civilian targets. 25,000 people were killed. Children, babies sleeping in their bedrooms were confronted with Allied bombings. It's 
researcher, the UK Prime Minister at that time, spoke of it was a moral bombing. It was extremely strong political violence. It was the demoralization of the German population by deliberately killing women, children, innocents. So I think when we think about fighting terrorism, conflict transformation, and human rights, to keep in mind what happened. In Hiroshima, it was nothing else but extremely strong violence, the deliberate and discriminate killing of the civilian population. Now, there were many islands already, there were many twin towers who were bombed already in history, speaking metaphorically. Our moral history of humanity is full of blood already. And talking about fighting terrorism, this has to be kept in mind. I want to show you another way, which is conflict transformation. Now, one of the major case studies I've done much research on is Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, the conflict was between Catholics, who see themselves as Irish, and Protestants, who see themselves as British. Catholics want a united Ireland, whereas Protestants want Northern Ireland to remain part of the UK, to remain British. The IRA, Irish Republican Army, sometimes called a terrorist organization, fought for the flag for United Ireland, Ireland against Great Britain. Now, conflict resolution happened in 1998 by the so called Good Friday Agreement, where they agreed on a shared power sharing government between Protestants and Catholics. Now, in Northern Ireland, former so called terrorists are in government. So, one strategy is politicization, to politicize former armed fighters. The IRA, as a political party, should say that is now in government of Northern Ireland. You can see here Martin McInnes, the former leader of the IRA, is now the deputy prime minister of Northern Ireland, and the joint government is his former post. Similar processes we can witness at the moment in the Philippines, in the southern part of Mindanao, where we also have the strategy to politicize armed groups, to politicize political violence, the transforming of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front into the United Nations Moral Justice Party. And there's a project going on called the DIPADEF project, a party building project funded by the European Union and the German Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And I was happy to help them and assist in the political training. You see me here sitting next to former so called terrorists, members of the MILF. And I was happy to try and teach and help them in the political education, politicization. So, one strategy make terrorists politicians, conflict transformation. And Mindanao, the peace process, is not in trouble because of the MILF, it's in trouble because it's seen. From the Manila establishment in the north is the nasty corner, it's the dirty corner. Nobody wants to go there anyway. It's dominated by Moros, by the Muslims, and we the Moros, we are the nice tourists, but we don't care about the peace in Mindanao. Let me turn to another case study of successful conflict transformation here in this nice country, Indonesia, Maluku. And the main island of Ambon always had the image of Ambon Manisi. Christians and Muslims live together in religious harmony. However, there was a very bad conflict between 1999 and 2002. 15,000 people were killed. And there's a thesis that it was provoked by outsiders, by a group, a so called terrorist group called Laskar and Jihad, who came to Ambon and killed many, many Christians. And Christians retaliated and killed many, many Muslims. It was solved and ended by a peace agreement, the Manino II agreement in 2002. And interestingly enough, from the perspective of conflict transformation, in 2011, the conflict almost erupted again. So it was again, groups tried to provoke it again with political violence. But a unique, a unique thing in Ambon, cultural conflict transformation was too strong for political violence. So this one has us. And Adad and Pilat the local mechanisms of self help between Muslims and Christians prevented another outbreak of violence. You can see here the Catholic Church in Ambon that had been destroyed by Laskar Jihad during the conflict. It was rebuilt together by Christians from Ambon and Muslims.
Muslims in our home. And in 2011, when extremists tried to provoke the conflict again, the local people, with the strong bondage of Adat and Pila Gangam, prevented another outbreak of violence. So that was a good example of cultural conflict transformation. Another way that we asked the role of international law in human rights legislation in fighting terrorism. And if you would ask, should terrorists have human rights at all? Or in this nice book, why not torture terrorists? So can we torture them or do they have human rights? And the United Nations is very clear, yes, terrorists have human rights. And you should call the terrorist national has to unfold the principles of law and order and human rights. But there's always a dialectic of international law. And we know that the achievements of enlightenment are human rights and international law. But terrorists was opposed to anything enlightenment has given us. Hide behind that international law at the same time. So in the UK, the Human Rights Act has helped 28 terrorists to stay in the UK. Those who challenge our existence of human rights and international law are very happy to hide and use these tools of human rights and international law to protect, to protect themselves. So, if terrorists have human rights, they use it as protection. What is more dangerous in terms of international law is that international law can become a weapon. Weaponized international law. That was a comment by Peter Berkowitz a response to the UN Resolution 2334, that was almost a month ago, which condemned, heavily condemned Israel. And the comment by Peter Berkowitz was, the United Nations and its Obama administration enabled us to bent on punishing Israel and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. In the process, they have accelerated the delegitimization of international law. So for international law is used as a weapon criticize this way, it delegitimizes itself. And that's a great danger of international law because the guardians of international law, like the US, the UK, and others, they are the ones I have shown you the pictures of Dresden before. That's another picture from Dresden where a German war widow stands in front of corpses looking for her husband. And the title of the book is called Terrorism. So the guardians of international law were criticized in Israel. They are the ones who bombed children in the bedroom in the middle of the night and are now playing the International Guardians of Peace. Let me make it absolutely clear. Israel should take no lectures from those so called guardians of the international law who use and recognize international law just to condemn Israel. It is never condemned the Palestinian Authority, never. What does this take us to in terms of the future of counter terrorism? a nice quote. An army general was asked, can you forgive a terrorist? He replied, God forgives. Our task is to arrange a meeting. Now, but with the help of God, there should also be another way to control our emotions and not to fall into the trap of force and force, because force at some stage only creates force. We have to find another way, and I call it defeating not by violence, but through because in my research, research I've done with many organizations in Northern Ireland, in the Balkans, in South Africa, in the Lebanon, in India, in the Philippines, and in Monaco, all so called terrorist organizations have one thing in common. This is called self justification. Political violence has a desire and a desperate need for self legitimization and self justification for their own people and for the international community. Because Political violence cannot be seen as senseless violence. Keep in mind the sociology of understanding, the subjective meaning they attach to their own violence. Can be seen as senseless violence. So they have to justify it. So understanding means understanding the meaning they themselves attach to their own violence. And this leads us to the critical juncture. My conclusion that this opens the opportunity to challenge the justifications and explanations. Legitimize the justifications, the ideologies, the so called terrorists would use to justify their violence. And the key legitimization is the first step to eventual defeat. I 
call this process understanding the others, understanding of violence. It's a nice quote by David Irvine himself, an ex terrorist from Long Island, but not in the IRA, the Protestant one, and I'll quote here for he said after he was released from prison. The only thing I can imagine to be more painful than self analysis is childbirth. So it's more painful than prison, more painful than violence if you are confronted with your own situation. And the self justification of political violence does not work anymore. And you have to self analyze yourself. Make these terrorists the chance of self analysis. Make them not by force to be killed, but make them by force to self analyze themselves. By education, political education, and awareness building. Politicization, as I said, is the key in many areas of our research. Understanding, I come back to the key term, understanding the other's understanding of violence. And this is the final conclusion. This is nice moral in Belfast. Peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. And yes, people might criticize, do you want to understand terrorism? I've been almost myself a victim of terrorism. And I have many, many very close friends who have family members killed by terrorists. And it's difficult for me and for them to make the argument for understanding. So it's as difficult for me as for anybody else. But I think it's worthwhile the journey to try if we want to defeat terrorism. Understanding the others is kind of violence. Thank you.